no country has ever had as much like it's my muse as Spain, just specifically the Delta de Ebre region. Delta de Ebre region. It's just the colors and everything is. I'd get on my bike. I'd bike for miles at a time just to take a single picture. Mine will come up soon. But I don't know. I mean, all my other countries in my portfolio, they have like maybe one to two pictures max. But in Spain, it has closing up on 80 pictures now, all of which are edited, completed, ready to send out to publishers when I prefer. That's the picture right there. Now, this picture specifically, Long Road Home, was one day um, I decided that I was going to go past what I usually do. I had biked nine miles out to a town, three, three towns over. And uh, I'd started pretty late. Usually I start pretty early, but today for some reason I decided to go as far as I could late. Uh, I decided to take a different way home. This is all rice fields, by the way. It's miles and miles of rice fields. I decided to take a different way home. By the time I reached the place where I took the picture, it was about 7.30 at night, sun was setting, and I had already biked 19 miles. And I still had about eight to go until I would reach home. By then, my legs were burning. I was ready to just pass out. I was, could not feel my face anymore. Mosquitoes were killing me. But, you know, I, I didn't even know what convinced me. I stopped, there's a car coming at me in that picture, by the way, I'd like to point that out too. <laughs> but I decided to stop in the middle of the road, middle of the road, like an idiot, take out my, pic, take out my phone, because I took this one with my phone, I'm not gonna lie about that. And I took the picture. And honestly, about that last part that I mentioned with the phone, I don't believe like what camera you take the picture with, that, that doesn't matter. It's really, the photography is what it means to you and how you're able to convey that emotion to other people. And what I think this picture conveys to me is that even though you're ready to just give up and sit down and cry in the middle of a rice paddy, you just gotta keep going because if you don't, the mosquitoes are gonna get you. <laughs> Thank you all. Good evening, I'm Christopher Wilkins and my poem Les Elebons you will find on page 44. Moral of the story is, when planning flights, always be sure to plan them when there's never going to be any bad weather. This was a trip from uh, Manchester, New Hampshire to New Orleans, it meant to be uh, direct, but we ended up going to Kansas City to try to get around the storm, but you can't always get around what has other plans. So anyway, this poem arose from the second leg of that flight down the river, the Mississippi and, well, the Missouri, of course. Les Elebons. Melick, wholly given to harmony and in good time, had this to say as we flew away. Les Elebons temps, les bon temps, but hold on, hold on, for my heart is hot, hot, full of Tennyson and the wine, roule, roule in the middle of a rain, actually in the midst of a storm, the jet rolling from Kansas City on to the big easy, Les A. We looked for more drink, a pen, but some on rats did the in-flight crossword wrong, so Maud it is, in a bed of daffodil sky, violets as blue as your eyes, up all night for your sake, thanks ever in the morning. You say, read to me and sing, so I do, a song at peace with itself, tuned to cedar, mute, gallant and unmeet, five miles above the river in the bending corn. The airliner twanged like a bowstring, turns, drops, and calms, but too late. The wine spills. Maud gets wet. Your gooey cookie drips chocolate everywhere. You dab it giggling on my nose. We laugh. We roll on. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Brewster. I don't even know what page I'm on yet, to tell you the truth. I've got um, foraging, was it 49? Foraging for food, 49. So I'm a member of the Maryland Writers Association, Charles County chapter. We have four people in the club that are, are in this book here. So if you're not a member and want a writer support group other than here, contact myself or Karen afterwards and we'll be glad to tell you what we do. I, this piece of work here is also from that same writer's prompt thing we did at the Madwoman Creek Art Center, where um, I did one for, uh, for that. Also, if I could stop for one second. Um, you've heard Neil up here talking, and it's, it's obvious from his demeanor 
that it is, it is his hope and his belief that he's making a difference. And his whole point behind this is that all of us see problems in front of us that we try to correct and we see a world that's hurting that needs some help and some love and we try and approach it the way we can. He does it by going to Ireland and communicating, Ireland, right? And communicating with people up there at the wall and by doing things like this by uh, the young man who really, 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 really likes poetry but is never uh, a photography but hasn't submitted anything yet and in the process of talking with him gave him the courage to bring a piece here that we had a chance to see. So if we could give Neil a hand, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, because Neil really is making a difference in the sphere that he's in. Foraging for food, the, the, foot, the I don't have a basket. I had a, a painting of a tree stump with snow falling all down around it and this huge puffy squirrel with the tail going up behind the back and he was, they had put uh, bird seeds on the, uh, on the top of the stump and he was eating. And that was the prompt for this. Foraging for food. Mama, he's back, my four-year-old whispered. He squirmed in my lap. It was snowing so we were inside reading, snuggled together in the window seat. Actually, I was pointing to the words and he was reading. Actually, he wasn't reading. I was pointing to the words and he was reciting what he knew by heart. Turning the page broke his concentration and he glanced out the bay window. I mimicked his glance. Sure is, I whispered back. He's a beauty. Look, he's eating, my four-year-old whispered. He started to bounce. Careful, I said, or we'll scare him away. I'm careful, he whispered. As if on stage and needing a prop, the gray squirrel carefully picked up a sunflower seed from the pile that we had placed on the tree stump outside the window. As if performing for a cooking show audience, he shelled and ate the kernel, paws and teeth moving at rapid machine speed, up, down, rotate, repeat. A quick look in each direction and he selected and ate another and another and another. Well, actually he wasn't eating, but storing them in his cheeks. We could see them expanding. Mama, I'm hungry, my four-year-old whispered. He smiled up at me. Hello, my name is Robin Karras, and my photograph is on page 43. And uh, before I begin, I would just like to say, as always, I'm bowled over by the immense talent that's been demonstrated here tonight and in the magazine and I'm just honored to be a part of that, so thank you. Uh, the Stone Hut photograph was taken in Phoenix, Arizona on the top of uh, South Mountain, and uh, we had gone to visit relatives, and my husband talked me into not taking my camera, my other small camera that records well, and my big camera lens, <laughs> and he suggested I use my phone to try to take some pictures on our trip. And I was a little bit of a snob, wasn't sure it was going to work, a uh, little resistant to change, but it worked out very, very well, and he's happy he didn't have to lug my stuff through the airport. Um, the stone hut, I was surprised to find out, uh, was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Great Depression between 1933 and 1940. I had never heard of it. Um, it was created by Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Great Depression was in effect, and he had developed the CCC as a way to get Americans back to work and protect our natural resources. Throughout South Mountain, there are a lot of these stone huts. Some of them are uh, shells. They aren't fully uh, still together. But this one was really, I mean, the roof, the sides, everything, it looked like it was just built, and uh, it was really awesome quality. Uh, the CCC basically took young men uh, and put them to work and gave them room and board. Uh, they later upped the uh, age of who could join and they let World War I vets and Native Americans, some possibly of the Hohokam tribe, uh, join up. The Hohokam tribe in Arizona helped build the irrigation systems there, so it was a, a good merriment of the two. Um, basically, they built everything on South Mountain, uh, 40 miles of hiking and equestrian trails, 18 buildings, ramadas, fire pits, water faucets, 
and of course uh, the 18 stone hut. So it was really neat. I didn't know anything about the CCC. I'd encourage you to look it up if you haven't heard of it either. And that's it. Thank you. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, my name is Nick, or Nicholas in the poem. Um, I wrote this poem uh, in response to a couple different things. Uh, inspirations from my own life. I unfortunately was displaced from my childhood home when I was 17 without will. Um, and I'm now 21 and trying to cope with that and trying to process that going throughout my life has been a reoccurring theme in the past couple of years. Um, recently, thanks to one of my professors, um, I was able to kind of start expressing myself through poetry and I've kind of found it as a hobby. Um, and then also responding to this poem um, was a memoir I read in my women writers class for the school. Um, and it gave me the inspiration to kind of write something like this. Um, and I think the poem kind of paints the scene for itself. So, yeah, it's called Two Home. Driving around the old cul-de-sac, it's hard to recognize what has stayed the same. The same brick pathway is laid, but I don't know who walks it. The same door locks, but I no longer own the key. I wonder if they have, the, have kids wandering the woods as we had, getting lost to memories birthed by the creek. I hope the energy they bring is better than the one we left behind. I'm sure the new owners can still hear the echo of us yelling, our demons radiating out from the walls. I pray they see better days. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kate Lassman, and uh, my poem is on page 11. I freely admit that I am a crazy cat lady. Um, I have four cats. And one of them was the inspiration of this poem on a day when I wanted to write, but it just wasn't coming. <laughs> she changed that. Hope's poem. I need a poem. I've been looking all day, but found none at the grocery store, among the bills I paid, or in with the laundry. No poems today in the painting above my desk, or in all the music I loaded on my phone. No poems today. Then hope, the regal brown tabby, jumps on my lap and purrs. I have a poem. <laughs> Anyone else getting nervous? <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Richard Taylor. I am the courier for the College of Southern Maryland and for Maryland Distribution Services. So. How ironic, I have a picture of a mailbox. <laughs> I get to travel a lot of back roads in Southern Maryland, Tri-County area, and there are some beautiful sights, absolutely stunning as you're going down the road. And one of them, um, Route 236, if anyone's familiar with Clements, the Amish farm area, well I get to travel that and I'm riding down that road and you know there's about this much shoulder on the road, right? I'm in the big green college van and representing College of Southern Maryland. I'm determined I'm going to get a picture of an Amish farm horse who every day stands up against the wall. He just stands there. And I was like, that is so fascinating. I've got to get a picture of this guy. Well, in the meantime, this, this gem, the, the mailbox just screamed. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm taking you home. <laughs> I have to do this, and I'm grabbing the bag and getting the camera, and there's no place to pull over. And I'm like, well, I'll just pull over in the grass, and the grass is this high, and I'm like, well, someone's going to call. Someone's going to call back and say, does the van broke down? Or, well, anyway, so I'm out there taking pictures, and traffic is trying to go around, and da da da, da and I thought, wow, you are so cool, and if you look carefully, there's a piece of mail in there. Yeah. <laughs> And I, thought, and I just clicked. I had to take 50 or 60 pictures of this guy. And I didn't submit right away. And my friend, Diane Payne, who is my camera mentor, thank you very much, helped me decide. Said, yeah, it just kept nagging. Submit it, submit it, you know. And I've had the honor of being published a few times. And wow, how cool is this, right? So anyway, I'm like, well, what do I name you? And I thought, Keith Richards. You know, <laughs> put a guitar with you and there you are, right? <laughs> and then, well, that changed. And I thought, how about selfie? Because, you know, it's got the little bald spot going on there. Kind of works. A retired male worker here. Not quite yet. 
But anyway, um, immediately, I'm still standing. It still has life, and it's beautiful. And thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Diane Payne. As I would say, Richard, once you, I saw that, that picture of your mailbox, you, I, you had to submit it. I'm just saying. You had to. It's just a great shot. Um, my photograph is on page 50. Um, it, it's this picture of a seashell. Um, it was taken at the Akakeek State Park. And I was just walking along. There's so many different trails uh, going through there, um, different farming. There's farm and animals. And, and I eventually, my feet led to down all the way down to the water, into my element. And uh, there was this long log. And on them was these tiny little seashells, these little shells. And of course, I had my big camera with me, a big Nikon, and I was taking it loading his very heavy uh, backpack around and everything and then I was like I really want to capture the details of these shelves and I was like how am I going to do that I'm fighting with my Nikon camera a little bit and I was like let me try my, my cell phone so I pull my cell phone out and I just really take my time and I really just got in close to these uh, she shells and it always amazes me capturing something so small it's only this small and then seeing it enlarge so big. It always amazes me. Um, but I, I just love how I was able to capture the gradation from light to dark and then just that, that powerful contrast at the end, just really just capturing those details. That with photography, it doesn't matter how big or small something is, it's just really taking that time and that moment to capture it. That was my photograph. And I'm also up here to represent my dad. And I just wanted to thank Neil. Really, this story really means a lot to myself and my dad. And I'm just truly honored, as your daughter, to read your story. And my dad's story is on page 26. This is actually going to be an early 85th birthday gift from my granddad, my dad's dad. He lives in Florida, so we're definitely going to mail out um, some <coughs> copies to him. Um, but his story is called How My Dad Sent Me to the Far House to Become a Man by Jim Payne. When I was eight years old, my dad put me on a 1953 GMC fire truck. I knew then in that very moment that was all I wanted to do with my life. The Brentwood chief was my dad's friend and he asked my parents to let me join the fire department. I was 16 when I joined and my first call came in when I was at my grandmother's house. The firehouse was nearby when I heard the sirens. We had a fire call in Cottage City. The next memorable fire call was in Brentwood, and that's when I saw a dead person for the first time. It was a husband and his wife trapped inside the, their burning house. After the fire was out, I had to bring both of them down the ladder. The department had six DOAs that week, and that included an ambulance call in Heightsville where a deputy chief a deputy sheriff committed suicide. On a lighter note, I was at the firehouse sleeping in when we had a house fire in Cottage City. I flew out of my bed so fast I didn't realize I didn't have my running boots on. When, I, when we got to the scene, I got off from the back of the fire truck, ran the hose down with my ass flapping in the wind, and ran back to the truck to tell them to charge the line. The chief told me to get back in the truck. <laughs> In 1972, I ran most, the most fire calls in Brentwood. I ran 250 calls out of 500 total calls that the department ran. Out of those calls, we had a four alarm fire in Blainsburg roller skating rink. I was so bad, it was so bad I, I had saw steel melting. By 1973, I, I was hired by the Walter Reed Fire Department. The bad experience that I remember that year was when the Vietnam soldiers were coming home from the helicopter, in the helicopters and I had to put them on the ambulance. In 1979, I transferred National Airport Fire Department. Being in the fire department is like having a big, fa big happy family. We ate lunch and dinner together and there would be cases where we would be away from our home for long periods of time. 
In between calls, we played tricks on each other. I watched my coworkers prank the pilots by super gluing a quarter on the ground, and I watched to see how many of them would pick it up. They also tricked. The, they also tricked. I'm losing my place. <laughs> they also tricked the pilots by putting a wallet on a fishing rod. I even. I was even pranked. They put a rescue dummy in my bed, and they put one in my car. <laughs> As a team, we saw and experienced a lot. We've had an ambulance call in Brentwood when a man had so much alcohol. So when he was riding in the ambulance, a man was kicking and screaming and claiming he was seeing snakes everywhere. Another crazy experience was when we arrived at the air gas welding company, the air tanks were exploding like rockets and we had to duck into the bushes. This is my favorite part. I met my wife three times before I married her. <laughs> the first time was my, at my dad's friend's house. He committed suicide. The second time was when she sat, she set me up with her goofy friend and we double dated at the movies. We ended up seeing uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> the third time was when I hurt my knee on the fire truck. I proposed to Elaine at Greenbelt Lake and we got married on July 1st, 1979. We'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. Time after time, Elaine has witnessed many, me coming home with battle scars from, my, from the job. One case was when I had fire training at Dallas Airport. I was fighting, fighting a big fire when smoke and flames went up my jacket, I came home with burns on my neck and hands. I was bandaged up like a mummy. Another case was in 1982. I was eating dinner with the boys when I heard an Alert 3 come in for a 737 airplane. In the severe snow conditions, a plane was missing off the runway. No one in the tower could see it, and eventually the plane crashed into the 14th Street Bridge. The assistant chief told me to put the airboat in the water, but on the way out to the sea, we got stuck on the ice. I helped the D.C. Fire Department pull, pull a 34-year-old man out of the water. His, he lost a leg, and he was already dead. I wasn't physically, physically hurt that day, but the emotional impact still haunts me today. In closing, I have been retired from the fire department for 20 years, and there are days when I still feel like the job is in my blood. I was on my way home one day from working on the fire extinguishers when I saw smoke from someone's house. There was a fire in their attic. I got the people out and tried to put out the fire with fire extinguishers. In another case, I was at home working on fire extinguishers when my, when my wife told me that the house next door was on fire. I, I took the fire extinguishers to the house and I got the girls out. I was able to put out the fire. No matter where I am, I will always try to help anyone the best way I can. I love being a firefighter. It has made me the man I am today. I have my dad to thank for it. Oh.